Good morning, good afternoon, depending where you are, uh, or good night in, in some cases. Um, great to have you with us today. I'm Andrew Seely, I'm the president of the Migration Policy Institute, and welcome to the launch of MPI's Migration Policy Institute's new Global Skills and Talent Initiative. Um, I will introduce, we have some truly fabulous speakers today, and I will introduce them in a moment. But first, let me tell you a little bit about the Global Skills and Talent Initiative that we're launching today at MPI. Um, demographic pressures, technological advances, economic shifts, and pandemic disruptions have been rapidly reshaping labor markets in the United States, Canada, Europe, Australia, and around the world, um, and resulting in workforce shortages and skills gaps that are sparking conversations about the role that immigration and immigrants play in meeting both current and future labor market needs. We are interested in talents and skills across a variety of sectors, from agriculture and care work to advanced manufacturing and technology innovation. And we're interested both in how both immigrant selection systems that make decisions about who can enter the country in the future um, and immigrant integration systems, credentialing in other areas that allow people already in countries to be more productive, how they play into labor markets of the future. Um, these are issues we've been working on for a long time, of course, at MPI, but the current state of labor markets makes it ever more urgent to focus specific attention on immigration within broader economic policy, and not just as a standalone set of policy decisions. We've seen significant efforts in the United States to improve visa systems to meet workforce challenges, and ambitious new policy efforts in Canada, Australia, and some countries in Europe to meet these challenges as well. And this is an issue that also matters in East Asia and even in some countries of the global south, which are starting to face worker shortages in particular areas. Um, we put all of our uh, research together on a single web page, which we'll share in the chat with you. Um, we will have it time after the presentations for some questions and answers that will be through a Q&A box that you have below. And you can, you can type your questions at any time into the Q&A box. Um, but uh, um, we, and we will get to those after we have the presentations and we look forward to, to engaging with your questions as well. Um, let me, before we go into the speakers and I introduce them, let me turn to two of my colleagues from MPI who can tell us a little more about what the Global Skills and Talent Initiative is. And let me go first to Kate Hooper um, in Washington, DC, uh, actually in New York right at the moment. Um, Kate, you authored a policy brief that is out today called What Role Can Immigration Play in Addressing Current and Future Labor Shortages? So what role can immigration play in labor markets? Tell us about it. Thank you, Andrew, um, and thank you for the introduction. I think that we've really seen that immigration has a very important role to play in addressing current and future labor market needs. So as you alluded to, advanced economies all around the world are experiencing these acute labor shortages, and it's not just at the sort of high skilled end. You know, we're seeing shortages emerge um, for specialist jobs in STEM sectors, but also in essential roles that are skilled but require fewer form of qualifications. So jobs in elder care, logistics, food production um, and construction. And these needs are really acute. And um, to give you an example, Germany estimates it needs 400,000 skilled workers in addition each year to meet some of its labor shortages. So the time is really right to start thinking about how immigration can start helping in this response um, to labor shortages. Um, there's been this growing focus, as you alluded to, on immigration as a tool to address some of these labor market needs. So we've seen some countries introducing new immigration channels or revisiting eligibility criteria for existing channels to make it a bit easier to admit workers with in-demand skills. We've seen others pursuing mobility schemes with other countries to recruit workers. One example of this is the EU's talent partnerships, which our colleague from the Commission may talk about in a moment. And as you mentioned, um, other countries like Australia and Canada, who are also joining us on the call, um, are embarking on a more systemic review of their immigration policies. Um, so there's little doubt that immigration can play an important role in helping meet some of these labour market needs. Um, but there are some important lessons here, which I think we need to reflect on as we embark on this work. Um, the first is that governments need to find the right balance between access and oversight. So on the one hand, thinking about how immigration policies can quickly admit workers with in-demand skills to really respond to some of these changing needs, but also making sure that these policies are admitting people to meet genuine shortages. And I think that's one of the sort of tensions that immigration policy needs to navigate. And one of the themes I pick up on in my new paper. Um, the second lesson is um, really that immigrant selection policies are important, 
but equally important are integration policies to make sure that immigrants can apply their qualifications and experiences in destination labor markets. So this is why we're really thinking about both selection policies, but also what lessons we can apply from integration policies as well to this work. The third, um, and as again you alluded to, is that immigration policies need to adapt to considerable uncertainty. Um, you know, we have a good sense of what current needs are in the labor market, but getting a sense of what future needs are is much, much more difficult. It's hard to, to really predict, you know, which jobs will exist and where they'll be located, you know, with all of this technological development, automation and the rise of remote work. So it's on the one hand, making sure that policies can respond quickly to changing needs, but also thinking through some of these different scenarios to anticipate which skills are going to be in demand and how to factor this into policy design. And in fourth and sort of final takeaway is really thinking about how immigration can form part of a broader skills and talent strategy. And I think that's really at the crux of what we're trying to do here. You know, to give you an example, if we're thinking about um, addressing shortages of doctors and nurses, we should be thinking about ways to link up um, you know, admission priorities and ethical recruitment practices with investments and training pathways, lifting barriers to entry for workers, you know, incentives for retention and opportunities for innovation. So I think decisions about immigration really need to be made in coordination with these decisions about education and training, productivity, and improving the labor market participation of local workers. So really the sort of final takeaway from me is that we really do need to have more joined up thinking on skills and talent. Thank you, Kate, that's great. Um, and Julia Gillette, you spent a lot of time thinking about this in the US context. Um, and you wrote a, a fabulous paper that was out a couple of weeks ago called Unblocking the U.S. Immigration System, Executive Actions to Facilitate the Migration of Needed Workers. There you cover about 30 different ideas on what can be done in the U.S. context, absent le legislation, knowing that it's unlikely that we'll see legislation. Can you give us just some, some highlights of, of what you say in that paper? What can happen in the U.S.? Yeah, sure. Um, thanks, Andrew. And nice to be with all of you. The framing for that paper is really similar to what Kate just mentioned is the you know, short term need um, for more labor supply and also longer term needs. In the US, we still have really tight labor markets with 1.7 open jobs for every unemployed worker, really low unemployment. Looking further into the future, <coughs> excuse me, we see an even clearer picture that the US economy would benefit from immigrant workers. Some of the largest Job growth that's projected is in fields where immigrants are overrepresented, such as computer programmers or home health care aides or personal care aides. And in fact, our demographic picture implies that immigration will be key to sustaining our economic growth and vitality. Projections suggest that all growth in our working age population will come from immigrants and their children from here out. Um, but the country's ability to draw on immigrant workers as a resource is really hampered by our outdated immigration system. Our immigration laws were last updated in 1990, back before most of us even had internet access. And this has a fixed set of caps and categories that aren't flexible to adjust to changing needs. As Congress has failed over decades to make needed reforms to our immigration system, we've seen the importance of executive action. Various presidential administrations have embraced their authority under current law to try to speed immigration, ease some of the challenges of our system, um, and in the current moment to ease some of the processing backlogs that emerged during the pandemic. We've seen a lot of steps that have been taken by the Biden administration to look at processing efficiencies at US Citizenship and Immigration Services, at visa processing and consulates abroad, but there's more that could be done. So as Andrew mentioned, we published a paper that looks at 21 steps that USCIS and the Department of State could take to facilitate the migration of needed workers to help retain immigrants who are already in our labor force and to ease some of the challenges that employers and workers are facing. A lot of these are really in the weeds, technical changes that are a little boring to talk about, but could nevertheless have big impacts. Things like shortening forms, making sure that we're not collecting repeat biometrics when they're not necessary, um, you know, auto extensions of work authorization to prevent people from losing their ability to work. Others are larger regulatory changes that would require more time to implement, but potentially have even bigger impacts, such as allowing more spouses of temporary workers to themselves work in the United States. Um, you know, given demographic trends ahead, although we also need to address challenges for US workers, some of the barriers that are keeping US workers out of the labor force and making sure that US workers have the skills and credentials needed to join higher paying jobs, immigration will need to be a part of our picture. And as Kate mentioned, you know, we're seeing countries around the world 
embrace this challenge and think about how their immigration systems can help them to address the demographic challenges ahead. We hope at MPI um, that having this global conversation about immigration and skills and talent can also help to elevate the US conversation and you know, move our Congress and our country in thinking about how immigration can help us to meet urgent labor needs now and into the future. Great, thank you, Julia. That's great, and thank you, Kate. I mean, wonderful uh, way to get into this conversation. And now it's my pleasure to go to the panel and to introduce Georgia Du, who is, of course, the director of U.S. Citizenship and Immigration Services. She comes with a long history as you know, general counsel of USCIS, senior roles in, in the Congress and at the State Department, and just a wealth of, of knowledge and background and has really been trying to take USCIS in new directions within existing legislation, but really try and show how we can, can meet the needs of the future. And so, Director Zhu, it's my pleasure to turn this over to you. Thank you, Andrew. I'm really honored to be here for today's event um, on your new initiative on global skills and talent. Um, particularly for us, um, with the focus on immigration and um, how it can address our labor market needs. It really is a privilege um, to join so many colleagues here from around the globe today and our audience, of course, who is listening in. Um, as uh, I think was just noted with the opening, um, the recent articles, uh, many countries benefit from immigration to meet labor market needs, including positions in both higher wage and lower wage sectors. Um, this isn't just a matter, of course, of improving the economy and our skills matching. Um, it's, it's beyond that. Um, every job filled by an immigrant represents the story of someone searching for better opportunity for themselves, for their family, for their community. Um, the United States has long been a destination for top talent from all over the world. And our ability to attract highly skilled workers and entrepreneurs has spurred for many years now, path-breaking innovation, leading to the creation of jobs, new industries, new opportunities for all. We also have to recognize, just I think as was noted, that um, the critical role that lower and mid-wage labor plays in every industry and how equally crucial these roles are in keeping the economy moving and thriving. Every year, uh, in the United States, we welcome hundreds of thousands of family members of US citizens and lawful permanent residents through our family sponsorship programs. So not necessarily focused on the employment side of things, but with the help of their family member, these individuals are well integrated into their new American communities and they bring with them their skills and their talent and they contribute those skills and talent to our economy at all levels and that is a tremendous benefit to the country. And of course, I don't wanna miss the mention of refugees, asylees, and other humanitarian immigrants that arrive in the United States fleeing violence and civil strife. Um, and when they arrive, they're also seeking to start a new life and are eager to contribute to their new country that has offered them refuge. But again, they're also contributing their talent and skills at all levels. In terms very specifically to our employment-based system that's very focused on connecting very directly a person to a job, we don't in the United States operate on a point-based system like some other countries do. Instead, we operate based on the direct needs of employers who, subject to certain caps, numerical limits, um, petition for non-citizen workers while ensuring that our US workers already here are protected. There are also several categories in which foreign nationals can self-petition if they meet certain criteria. In implementing the law and helping meet the, what is really an ever-changing um, need for our US labor market, USCIS um, is committed to becoming more efficient, more transparent, more accessible. But before we begin um, to discuss where we're headed in the future, we have to first discuss a few of our recent accomplishments that are setting us up for that bright future. Since I joined USCIS in August of 2021, 
my work and the work of USCIS as a whole has been guided by the executive orders issued by President Biden, and particularly the executive order directing us to eliminate unnecessary barriers and to restore the faith in the immigration system, as well as those that are relating to transparency, efficiency, and the customer experience. Although there is much, much work ahead of us, we continue to apply every workforce, technological, policy, operational tool that we have at our disposal to increase the efficiency and accessibility of our immigration system. So let me share some of our examples that were highlighted in a recent report uh, that we called the Fiscal Year 2022 Progress Report. Together, USCIS and the Department of State issued all of our available employment-based immigrant visas for the year, fiscal year 2022. That's nearly 280,000 green cards. And what's so unprecedented about this is it's double the pre-pandemic number. Also through joint rulemakings between the Department of Homeland Security and the Department of Labor, USCIS has made available more supplemental H-2B non-agricultural worker visas than ever before. And of course, ensuring um, robust protections for US and foreign workers alike. We've also published a comprehensive menu of options for STEM professionals, science, technology, engineering, math, um, professionals seeking to work in the United States. We've provided detailed policy guidance for those seeking um, what's termed O-1 status, for individuals of extraordinary ability or those seeking EB2 status with a national interest waiver that allows them to self-petition. And aware, of course, of the many recent layoffs in the technology sector, we published options and useful information for employees across the country facing termination and those in this vulnerable situation. We also published a comprehensive menu of temporary and permanent options for non-citizen entrepreneurs who are seeking to start and grow their companies in the United States. And that includes the investors, executives, highly skilled workers, independent of labor market tests, and that do not require uh, what our labor certification process. We also published detailed policy guidance for the international entrepreneur rule which is a pathway designed especially for high potential startup founders. And USCIS recently eliminated many of the previous delays faced by the spouses of E and L visa holders who wish to work in the United States by recognizing that such persons are authorized to engage in employment incident to their E and L spousal status. We also established a process for healthcare and childcare workers to expedite the processing of their work permit applications that really are just so critical in this moment. These efforts expand the pipeline of global talent that has always strengthened our nation's health, our security, our economic prosperity. But um, despite these many successes, we're, we're really excited about our work has not ended. We have much more ahead of us. We're continuing to build on this progress by implementing premium processing for all employer petitions for immigrant workers. That's our form I-140 for many of you who are familiar. Also for employment authorization and change of status applications for students and exchange visitors. Again, for those who know our forms, um, I-765, the I-539, and there's more to come. We're simplifying several major forms, which I know Julia just mentioned, the need to simplify because our forms have only gotten longer, our questions have gotten more complex, and we have gone back to the drawing board to really ask ourselves, do we really need these very long forms to get at exactly what we're trying to get at here? And so we've, we've simplified some of these major forms, including the applications for employment authorization, again, the I-765, the adjustment of status, the 485, and for naturalization, the N-400. Uh, we're making very clear in our public guidance that when non-citizens with temporary status are laid off, as I mentioned earlier, or otherwise terminate employment, they have options 
to remain in a period of authorized stay in the United States that exceeds the maximum 60-day grace period for maintenance of status. We're also developing um, proposed rules to modernize and reform the H-1B, H-2, and other employment-based immigration programs. And, which is of really high importance at this very moment, given some of our recent backlogs and increased processing times, we continue to focus very, very heavily on reducing those backlogs and reducing those processing times across the board. So while I'm pleased to have shared how far we've come as an agency, our commitment continues. In the months ahead, we plan to build on this fiscal year 2022 progress by exploring additional policy and operational measures to continue to improve our processing times, our efficiency, our accessibility, our transparency, our customer experience, um, we recognize there's a lot more to do to eliminate the unnecessary barriers and restore faith in the immigration system. And we remain committed to these goals and expect more progress as we continue to attract the necessary talent that we all need to meet the labor market needs. And thank you again for having me. Thank you, Director Dudu. That's great. And, and really, uh, really pleased to see the progress you've made and, and some of the plans you have coming down the line here as well. Um, we'll turn now to Canada and Deputy Minister Christiane Fox. Canada has been a country that long has thought about its, its uh, immigration policy as part of its broader economic and labor force policy um, and has some very ambitious goals. And so we're, we're joined by Christiane Fox is the Deputy Minister for Immigration, Refugees and Citizenship Canada, IRCC. Um, she was previously Deputy Minister for Indigenous Services, um, for Intergovernmental Affairs and for Youth and has a, a large number of other senior senior posts, including the Privy Council uh, before her current position. And it's been our great pleasure to get to know her over the past few months. So Deputy Minister Fox, tell us a little bit about what Canada is looking at uh, going into the rest of 2023 and beyond. And I know you've just gone through a strategic or you're going, you're finishing up a strategic review at this moment as well. That looks at a lot of these issues. Absolutely. Uh, and thank you. Thanks for having me. And it's great to be uh, with uh, with MPI and, and my colleagues uh, from around the world. Uh, merci beaucoup. C'est un grand plaisir. So I'm here uh, from Ottawa, and I would like to begin by acknowledging that I am on the land of the traditional unceded territory of the Algonquin Anishinaabek people. And some of you may be joining us from the traditional territories of other peoples, and I invite you to acknowledge them as well. Um, and thanks for having me, um, uh, Dr. Seeley. I think you and your team have been instrumental in some of the work that we've been doing here in Canada over the last, uh, um, I guess, over the last since my arrival in July, but over years, uh, there's been a partnership. And, and I do want to thank you for allowing this great conversation today. Um, as you've noted, uh, we've been working hard on uh, our immigration system, uh, an immigration system that we obviously want to work for Canadians, but also all of our clients, uh, both uh, here in Canada and abroad. And um, and our last federal budget, which was just at the end of March, did recognize this continued um, uh, commitment and importance of migration and newcomers to Canada. The, the plan that we have uh, tabled will see a welcoming of 500,000 immigrants by 2025. So we're seeing sort of steady growth from year to year and funding to support that. And, uh, and also some funding for expanding the um, electronic travel authorization program. So that is really uh, to promote um, uh, visa-free travel to low-risk trusted travelers from uh, additional visa required uh, countries. And so uh, big uh, big focus for us, obviously, with, uh, with the budget. And then of course, uh, as my colleague has noted, um, we're also making some progress on uh, processing times. And, and that has been a, a huge pressure point for the department in terms of the volumes that we have seen and trying to get back to service standards, but also actually looking at our models and seeing whether or not they ha we have the right service standards in our system right now to be competitive, to attract talent. And so um, I think uh, we've made great efforts to try to get back to what those service standards uh, were prior to COVID. But I think the department is very much focused on moving forward. Where do we wanna be as a country? Um, We've also been in extremely focused on uh, crisis response uh, in terms of Ukraine. Over 130,000 Ukrainians and their family members have come to Canada uh, since we began our Canada-Ukraine Authorization for Emergency Travel Initiative. That was more than a year ago. 
We've just recently extended that, that initiative to mid-July uh, for new applications. So that has obviously been a big focal point uh, for the government. And then, of course, Afghanistan. Uh, Canada has made a commitment to resettle at least 40,000 Afghans by the end of this year, so December 2023. Uh, we're now almost at 30,000 Afghan nationals, so we knew need to uh, keep working through our humanitarian programming to respond, not just to these crises, but obviously um, uh, those to come. And, and we see this work uh, in the broader context of our country and the world, uh, as you have noted, and the work of MPI around uh, top talent and global comp competition for top talent. Uh, we're all facing uh, many similar challenges around demographics, around economic context. Uh, we're seeing a growing number of people on the move uh, and, and looking at how Canada can, can play a role. Um, you know, we have uh, recently concluded uh, the SCCA um, uh, additional protocol with our colleagues in the United States. And as part of that, Canada has a commitment to welcome uh, 15,000 migrants from the Western Hemisphere on a humanitarian basis, but with a path to economic opportunities. And, and most importantly, this will be through sort of regular and managed migration pathways uh, as an alternative to irregular migration. And, and I think we've spent a lot of time in our department thinking about uh, the importance of these pathways given the displaced population around the world and also the importance of safe, orderly, and managed migration uh, to maintain public confidence in the immigration system. And, um, and Canada um, you know, has to play its role internationally in terms of um, creating these pathways. Uh, and we have to do that by upholding the integrity of our immigration system. And that's through continued support for ethical recruitment of foreign workers and that including uh, workers for uh, circular migration. And, and as you all know well, uh, the international context, the numbers are staggering. According to the uh, UN Refugee Agency, over 101 million people were forced to flee their homes last year due to conflict, human rights violations, fears of persecution. And so the future looks to be just as challenging where environmental disasters, climate change may obviously make things worse. So as we think about um, the system and Canada's programs, we are always kind of looking to partners like MPI and others to know and, and better understand future trends and position our country to be responsive to those trends. Um, our context, um, as, as, as noted uh, in, uh, in other um, uh, uh, conversations, our population is of course aging. Uh, what I find staggering when I look at some of the data um, the numbers of workers available for each retiree has been on a, you know, a steady decrease for decades. Um, just to give you a bit of context, over 50 years ago, we had seven workers uh, for each retiree in Canada. Today, we're about three workers for each retiree. And in Atlantic Canada, we're looking at two workers for each retiree. And therefore, immigration has to be uh, part of our response as a country uh, to look at not just um, what our big cities need, but also our regional economies and looking at regional immigration. We've got a record high job vacancy in key sectors like healthcare, over 800,000 job vacancies in all industries across our country. But at the same time, there is anxiety due to fears of a possible recession, high inflation, rising interest rates, putting pressures on consumers, um, this has had a greater impact on racialized people, Indigenous people, people with disabilities and mortgage holders. And so as we navigate this, you know, this space of possible recession with uh, a near high uh, record job vacancy, how do we bring in the right type of talent, not just to think about the needs of today, but future needs as well. And a big part of our focus in this country has been around foreign credential recognition it has often acted as a barrier to hiring professionals in many critical um, sectors. And I mentioned healthcare, um, working very closely with the provinces and territories. We are looking at how can we make uh, progress in this space because there's a lot of people here in this country right now, not working in critical areas that we need as a country. And so um, as we think about processing and our service challenges, we need to think about how do we actually um, bring people to the country in a timely and efficient way? 
Um, how can we do that in uh, the critical areas that we need now in terms of our economy? How do we think about our future economy and our future needs and where we go? And then how do we think about humanitarian crisis? Afghan, Ukraine, uh, it has put uh, um, a pretty big pressure on our settlement support, on our social services, on housing in this country. And this is why um, we do feel a sense of urgency here in Canada in terms of our actions and, and how do we transform our immigration system to meet these challenges, both kind of in the short and longer term. And uh, Dr. Zilli, you mentioned our strategic immigration review. We definitely feel this is the right time to review our system. And I know some of our colleagues have um, under, undergone similar exercises. And I think one of the, the key takeaways that we've talked about is around the need to take a step back from what has been a pretty siloed approach to programming in terms of you are an economic immigrant, you are a refugee, you are asylum seekers, and our program tends to kind of bucket people into very specific streams. And I think now we've got to think about um, our programs and our system in that broader a step of people can be in more than one bucket. Family reunification matters to regional economic development. Economic immigration can mean a pathway for refugees, for students. Uh, and so for that to take shape, we at the immigration department have to step back and not just work with other government departments that are managing uh, local infrastructure or healthcare systems, but also partners, both from a provincial and municipal government standpoint, but Indigenous partners, youth, international partners. This is all part of our review. And it's really, um, you know, how do we position ourselves for Canada's future immigration? And, and that's something that's been top of mind. And, and, you know, a pillar of that is about skills and talent. Uh, we are trying to be more nimble in our, our programming, to look at simplification, to look at partnerships. We're seeing the benefits of exploring models like a trusted partner model, where we work with businesses across the country. We have an initiative right now in one of our provinces in New Brunswick, uh, a critical worker pilot that accelerates the intake of workers and businesses then provide housing, language training, different types of settlement supports. And it's through, I think, these partnerships that we're gonna kind of try to meet our objectives as a country. We're developing new programs to advance refugee labor mobility, to recognize, as I said earlier, that refugees can also be economic migrants. And we have to change the narrative and they've been very valuable to skills and talent. So when we look at economic mobility pathways or the Global Task Force on Refugee Labor Mobility, these are ways that we're trying to test out new approaches to look at maybe less traditional ways at responding to the economic context in which we find ourselves. And we have to ease the process for internationally trained professionals. As I mentioned, we have to encourage newcomers who need licenses to practice in their profession in Canada to begin that process before they arrive. We've got to facilitate that by working with our provinces and territories. I have to admit that at one point, we do have a point system through our express entry. And you know, when we invite people uh, to apply for a PR, a permanent resident stream, we actually put in our letter of invitation, the complexities of foreign credential recognition in Canada. And, and we kind of put it on an individual to try to navigate that. I think we have to turn that around. And I think we have to think about as a country, how can we be more welcoming? How can we look at foreign credential recognition differently and address those barriers by providing sort of overseas and in Canada services through settlement programs and, and really facilitating that recognition process? We have to improve Canada's existing programs for skills and talent. Um, Express Entry has been a great system for us, but it needs innovation. And so as part of... Um, a revamp of Express Entry 2.0. Um, starting this spring, we're going to see the, the category-based selection where we've been working with partners to identify areas of critical need for the country now and have the ability to draw uh, people from that system. Uh, we have a priority in terms of Francophone immigration in this country. How can we draw the pools of talent uh, that find themselves in, in our Express Entry system? So we've got to spread the economic benefits of immigration across the country, and we've got to be a bit more nimble in how we do that. And we have you know, provincial nominee programs, and we also have to have maybe dedicated programs to look at specific needs. 
our Atlantic Immigration Program has actually started to have meaningful impact in Atlantic provinces to have greater immigration and greater retention in these provinces, which is key. We now have a rural Northern immigration pilot. We need to see and learn from that and, and be able to potentially turn that into a more permanent program as we did with the Atlantic immigration um, program. So we really need to think about how do we attract talent, retain talent and develop that across our country. Um, in terms of MPI's work, I, I, you know, I, I talk and stress the partnership uh, the work you're doing on future of work, on digital nomads, for instance, on strengthening asylum systems, on fostering international cooperation, it's helping us to understand how immigration, it's, it's one tool among many in supporting economic growth. And we must also consider how domestic policy responses to issues like productivity and competitiveness, to the use of AI, to building an inclusive economy, how do these um, uh, things kind of work together. And we've had lots of conversation and, and a lot of people in our country are linking kind of immigration ambition with housing availability in this country. So how do we work with partners uh, to make sure that when people come to Canada, um, that they have um, the social supports, the housing availability to be able to strive. And I think that that helps us a lot, even within our country around social cohesion and around, um, you know, a, a welcoming uh, immigration system. And so uh, really um, uh, proud to partner with MPI on a lot of these issues and think about and, and keep us thinking about future trends. Um, so on our immigration review, uh, we've had uh, a number of dialogue, dialogue sessions across the country. Uh, we've been in large and small centers. We've traveled uh, across our provinces and uh, and soon to be going up north to the territories and the Yukon to think about what are the complexities around our current system? What are some of the issues related to set settlement and integration? How do we actually attract top talent in this country? And what are the barriers that businesses are seeing or academics are seeing in recruiting uh, to, to fill those top talent jobs? And so we're looking at regional needs, community needs, and finally labor market needs. And so we will have a chance through this review to build on, you know, strengthening partnerships. Think about client service excellence in a different way. I think it was Julia who noted um, the importance of thinking not about the individual, but about the spouse, about facilitation. And I think we need to do more of that in our system. And we need to position Canada as a global leader. So in closing, I would just say that um, we want to be intentional about our approach to economic immigration. And, uh, and, and but not see it as solely an economic endeavor. And we need to ask ourselves, what else can we do? How can we innovate? And today's conversation really allows us to do that. So thank you so much for uh, including us in today's dialogue. Merci beaucoup. Merci beaucoup, uh, Deputy Minister. Thank you for, for joining us. And you give us a lot to re reflect on here. Um, let me now turn to uh, Michael Schotter, who is the Director for Migration, Asylum and Visas uh, in the uh, Directorate General of for Home Affairs in the European Commission. Uh, Michael, it's also been a pleasure to get to know you since uh, since COVID eased and we were able to travel here again. We actually have a, a sister organization, MPI Europe, which is based in Brussels, where I am right now, actually. Um, and so work a lot with, with you and your team and, and uh, great to hear your reflections. I know you've been working on a number, there's a number of countries in Europe that have been looking at exactly this question about skills and talent and trying to figure out what the future holds how they need to adjust their legislation. You have been you know, looking both at the European Pact on Migration Asylum, but also the European Year of Skills and look forward to what you have to tell us. Michael. Thank you very much, Andrew. And uh, thank you very much uh, to MPI more generally for inviting us to participate uh, from the, the European angle. But listening to the two previous speakers, I'm struck by how many common uh, insights uh, there are in, in this area common challenges. On the European side, of course, um, when I speak, I speak uh, with our, a bit more complex uh, uh, governance structure that we have. Um, we have a, what we call a, a sort of shared competence in the area of, um, of uh, legal uh, migration. Uh, we, we depend also on the member states to to fix the numbers. So we have to work in partnership with member states. But putting that to one side, um, what can I say? Well, we have the same labor shortages 
uh, that we face uh, in Europe presently. We have, uh, we've been facing these over the past years, but uh, they haven't gone away. In fact, they, they really have uh, accentuated. Um, back in 2019, we saw that 77% of companies were struggling to find employees. Of course, 2019 was pre-pandemic. The pandemic um, obviously paused things for, the, for a moment, but uh, we now have more vacancies uh, now that the, the, we're getting back to a sort of more normal situation. So there are now about 6 million uh, job vacancies. Um, and of course, employers and employees together um, have a crucial role to play in tackling labor shortages. Uh, and we also need, see the need uh, to, to have obviously smart uh, labor policies in place to make sure you best use your, your, your local talent. But undoubtedly, we have a number of structural um, drivers for the persistence of these labor shortages. And these are, of course, the, the aging of our society, the, the shrinking of the workforce, um, and the, the fact that these, uh, we have now new strategic uh, sectors that are, uh, are opening up, in the, for example, in the digital and green transitions, and we need to, to fill these, these gaps. Um, and that's where I think uh, labor migration can play a, a very important part, and of course, the investment that we need to put into skills. And that's why um, I think it's uh, no surprise that President von der Leyen, who's president of the European Commission, um, focused on this on this topic in her State of the Union uh, speech for uh, 2022. So this year is actually, as you alluded to, uh, Andrew, the European Year of Skills. Uh, and that, I think, highlights the importance that we're attaching to the importance of upskilling and reskilling uh, more people with the relevant labor market skills. Um, there, um, our adult learning remains low um, with a participation rate of around 37%, but we have set ourselves a target that by 2030, 60% of adults should participate in re and upskilling each year. And this is a big, big endeavor. Uh, requiring companies, workers, social partners, training providers, local authorities, employment services, all to come together. And in particular, to focus on those strategic sectors, um, for example, in the uh, encouragement of the green and the digital transitions that we, we're focusing on. But of course, in all of this, labor mig migration will also play a, a very, very important part. Um, at the present, we see that non-EU nationals represent uh, more than 5% of the total EU population. By far the long, largest number of people present uh, in this category are here, obviously, lawfully, uh, via uh, lawful routes. Um, uh, and this is uh, something that we want to build in, build on. So uh, in your introduction, you also mentioned this um, new pact, uh, as we call it, on migration and asylum. This is our comprehensive um, asylum and migration uh, agenda that we set out in September 2020. And it's uh, comprehensive in its scope, covering all the different dimensions of asylum and migration policy. But two aspects I think that are, are crucial um, are the need to attract skills and talent to the European Union through labor pathways, through legal pathways, so this was something that the previous speakers picked up on. We really want to encourage this, these routes in. And we see the interconnectedness of all these different policy strands. We need to have a, a whole of government approach. And we need to also, you can't do this without developing strong partnerships with, with uh, partner countries around the world. So all of this comes together. Uh, and of course, as you mentioned at the beginning, Andrew, integration plays a, a really fundamental part, part of this as well. So, um, of course, I, as the previous speaker mentioned, um, crises keep <laughs> cropping up at, at, and, and we've had a very, very big one in the last year uh, relating to the, um, the Russian invasion of Ukraine and the number of displaced people. We, as a result of that, put in place a, a temporary protection status for those fleeing the, the conflict, and there were millions of them, and that temporary protection status gave right uh, of access to the labor market, and we've tried to sort of 
use that also to 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 sort of match where where appropriate the the skills that they, they those uh, fleeing the conflict had to get them into the labor market um, so that was also a very useful experience because we use this as a as a pilot for a, a bigger project that we're going to roll out in the coming years and it's it's a very ambitious project from our side which is called the eu talent pool which is a will be a matching um, uh, device or, or mechanism to help um, match up um, the labor market needs of which there are as i just mentioned quite a few with the uh, talent that's out there um, we will have to obviously develop this in a way that it, it properly recognizes the need for the proper skills to be uh, recognized and acknowledged and validated. And this will give um, the employers the, the confidence in the tool. And as I mentioned before, we obviously have to do this in close partnership with the member states, because our member states are the ones that are the ones that uh, will give the permission to enter the territory, the visas, etc. So we will need to work very closely with them to identify their their labor market needs, their particular categories or, or, or sectors of employment where that those needs are. And at the same time, we, um, we're thinking of matching this up with another initiative called the Talent Partnerships, which is part of our sort of external partnership approach to working with partner countries. And um, the idea that we're um, contemplating is to link the talent pool with the talent partnerships not exclusively, but there would also be um, a, a sectoral, more strategic base. So for example, for those green or, or digital needs uh, for those sectors, that would be one pathway into the, into the talent pool. But another pathway or, or means of accessing the talent pool would be also through these talent partnerships. So again, as, as Christiane was mentioning, you know, it's wrong, I think, to see these as separate buckets that you need to sort of see this as a, as a whole of, uh, uh, as a holistic uh, uh, approach. Uh, and that's what we're, we're working on. The talent partnerships um, concept is intended to be very flexible. So it's not just to match up with the needs of the member states, but also to work in partnership with the partner countries. So we, for example, we have started already with Morocco, Tunisia, Egypt, and also been engaged in, in quite uh, detailed discussions with the, with Pakistan and Bangladesh. Here we sort of would join up a sort of strategic approach um, to our migration policy, but also identifying these labor market needs. And doing it in partnership with these countries means also working with their interests. What are their sensitivities? And you see that they won't necessarily come at it from entirely the same angle. So we have to work closely with, with the partner countries and tailor make each of these partnerships. So that's uh, our observation so far. Um, taking it forward, this, this talent partnership concept is also quite flexible in the sense that it could be high skills, it could be low skills, it could have a, a training dimension to it. I think training and, and the validation of the skills will be an absolutely fundamental part of the, of the concept. So those are a number of the um, projects we have in mind. More broadly, the European Year of Skills will go beyond the, the talent pool and the talent partnership um, and will um, involve how we can improve our, uh, our, for example, our digital skills. We have a EU's 2030 digital targets through a digital decade. So in the European Year of Schools, we'll, we'll try and accommodate all these different angles. So it will be a a busy year for us um, because of, on top of all of that we have uh, a, our work cut out in, in trying to um, consolidate the work we're doing on the re other aspects of this new pact on migration asylum. There are a number of legislative reforms more broadly so it's, it's a busy year ahead but uh, one that uh, is very important for us. So thank you. Open to any questions if you have, if you, if you want to come back and, and follow up on any of that. Thank you. Michael, that was great and a and very busy agenda indeed and, and a lot of moving parts in it. So looking forward to the questions and answers. We are going to, uh, you know, this has been very rich presentations. I'm mindful that we're getting 
close to the end of the hour, so we may go five or 10 minutes over. I hope some of the speakers can stay because I do want to get to some of the questions and answers. But first, it's my great pleasure to introduce Patrick Hallinan. Um, Australia is a, a country that has been also at the forefront of thinking about skills and talent skills in and terms talent, of its, in terms its immigration, of its immigration policy. policy. And very much embedding one in the other rather than as a, as a separate That's area. A separate area. I'm getting an echo I'm here, an I think. Echo but, here, uh, I think but, uh, let me just say that Patrick Helen is the regional manager for the Americas for the Home Office, for the Home Ministry of uh, the Australian government. He comes with a long history serving not only in the Home Ministry, but also in uh, the Prime Minister's Office, in the, the prior Immigration Citizenship Ministry, as well as in the private sector. And uh, we always you know, enjoy exchanging points of view with our colleagues in Australia because, you know, they are immensely thoughtful on these issues. And I know you're going through a strategic review, right? You're just finishing a strategic review and you've been thinking about what the next steps are going forward. So Patrick, let me turn it over to you. Thank you, Andrew. Um, I hope everyone can hear me okay. Uh, look, I, I'm going to, I'm conscious of time. I'm also conscious that there's a risk that I would repeat a lot of the things that previous speakers have mentioned, uh, but sort of First and foremost, uh, you know, I think it's worth acknowledging Australia is very much a migrant nation. All right? So um, migration to Australia, fundamentally important, fundamentally important to us economically, fundamentally important to us socially, uh, to the country that we now are. In fact, in our late, latest uh, census of the Australian population, for the first time, um, at least since the British settlement um, uh, in 1788, uh, one in two Australians was either born overseas or had one of their parents born overseas. I think that's quite stark. Uh, but Andrew, going to your point around skilled migration, you are right. Um, so the government commissioned, and uh, I'll emphasise this point, in the context of the Jobs and Skills Summit in September 2022, uh, they announced a review, a strategic review of Australia's migration program. Um, that's instructive. It demonstrates the extent to which migration, skilled migration is fundamentally important to uh, our productivity, uh, to how our economy functions uh, and the central central role that it plays. Um, so that uh, review, and it's currently with government. So there's somewhat, I'm somewhat limited in the things that I can talk about publicly, but suffice to say, it's the first sort of holistic review, if you'd like, of Australia's migration program that's been conducted since about 1994. It's looking at a variety of the things uh, that previous uh, previous speakers have touched on. Uh, and a lot of that really is about how do we modernise our system? How do we make it most efficient? How do we ensure that we're getting the skilled migrants um, that we need in the sectors that we need them and the places that we need them uh, in a manner that is efficient, in a manner that's beneficial, um, both for them and both for us. Uh, we're also very much, uh, I guess, recognising the fact that this is a global challenge. Um, the various issues that were, that were touched on uh, by Christiane and Burr and Michael uh, are also at play in Australia. So we have demographic change, we have sort of um, reducing over time productivity, if you would like. Uh, we have a variety of issues that a lot of, uh, a lot of the sort of developed world uh, is confronting in a new dynamic evolving world. Uh, so skilled migration is fundamentally important how, how we address that. Um, the minister is going to use the, the review recommendations to develop a new architecture for how our skilled migration program and our migration program more broadly works. Uh, so we're likely to engage publicly in consultations on that in the next few months um, so that we can really shape uh, and redesign our system so it works for Australians uh, and obviously works for the migrants that we would love to have come and relocate to Australia and contribute to our country. Um, I might just talk more generally about migration program design. Uh, so as I, as I alluded to, um, it's a fundamentally important part of, of uh, the functioning of Australian society and Australia's economy. Um, the government reviews our migration levels on an annual basis. Um, that is done through the budget process. Uh, again, it gives you a sense that this is very much interconnected with our broader consideration around our labour market needs. Um, I think Kate touched on earlier the importance of uh, also not just, I guess, um, worrying about it simplistically through an immediate migration requirement, but also what does it mean for your skills agenda? What does it mean for your uh, sort of indigenous development uh, and economic um, development requirements? Um, we are about, in this program years, for our program years around financial years, we are aiming for 195,000 permanent migrants to Australia. Roughly 142,000 of those migrants will, will fall in the skilled migration stream. That will be the largest skilled migration intake in Australia's history. Uh, we're on track to deliver it, um, but again, what it goes to show, I guess, is the extent to which this is very much a real issue for us uh, at the moment. 
we've had, um, I think for some time now, uh, quite a well-developed uh, approach to migration uh, and skilled migration, but it was clearly time for a review uh, to see whether the rules that we had, despite the fact it's quite flexible, uh, were still fit for purpose. Um, what we've seen over time is a shift away from the sort of points tested, highly skilled individual approach to employer sponsored uh, and state and territory government sponsored. And Christiane was mentioning earlier some of Canada's work around the sort of regional focus, um, very much remains a focus for us in Australia as well. Uh, Importantly too, and one of the other speakers spoke about social cohesion aspects or family reunion aspects, um, it varies depending on visa type, but overwhelmingly uh, yeah, our, our, our visas are issued in a way which a skilled migrant can be accompanied by their family members. Uh, and so looking at the various issues that others have talked about in terms of how do we maximise best value uh, from those individuals as well, often who are very skilled in their own right or bring enormous value in their own right, uh, to sort of Australia is also one of the things that we look at. But as a general rule, they'll have work rights um, in their own right. Uh, to give you a little bit more context, we probably have at the moment a little bit over a million uh, temporary visa holders in Australia onshore who are there for either direct employment related work um, or otherwise sort of uh, tied. Um, their conditions there at the visa are very much tied to employment. There are others where they have a right to work, um, at quite a large number, uh, but sort of if I'm thinking more particularly about temporary workers in, in the Australian context at the moment, we would have um, over a million uh, who, would, who would qualify there. And we've got roughly 600,000 international students uh, on shore at the moment. Um, again, they have a, a right to work. Uh, those various sort of streams, if you'd like, uh, have been some of, the, some of the ways in which we deal with um, a variety of the different needs in the economy for skills. So in some cases, uh, you know, university students might find themselves in lower skilled employment, um, you know, working in retail, working in hospitality, working in areas where we have, uh, we have key demands. Um, but the government has also shown we have a, a, a sort of, and I think it was Christiane as well who touched on these two sectors, we have significant demands in the near term in healthcare, we have significant demands in the near term uh, in education. So what we have done is we've targeted those two sectors uh, and we've, um, I guess we're doing a variety of things. Uh, so. What we're looking at at the moment uh, under ministerial direction is, I guess, rapidly processing, streamlining, uh, and making it easier uh, for those um, people with those skill, skill sets uh, to move into Australia and make a contribution uh, to our society. Um, that's important. I, I think it's, it's um, also instructive in terms of our broader thinking about how do we be competitive? How, how do we remain competitive? How do we remain a, a destination country of choice? Uh, for skilled migrants because they play such an important role in our economy and such an important role in our society. Um, in, in that respect, we've also got uh, a number and, and these things will be subject uh, again to the review. So, But at the moment, we do have some temporary critical skills, so, skills shortages visa types. Um, uh, so they're used where we have very particular requirements in the economy. Um, we have issued 73,000 uh, of those particular visa types uh, since July 1 last year. Um, so it just gives again an example, if you'd like, of the effort we've put in. I think both Ur and Christian focused on also the, the effort that's gone in their respective services to dealing with backlogs. We've done the same thing uh, and the, the government has invested heavily in making sure we have the right processing capability. Look, the only um, sort of other comment that I wanted to make, if you'd like, because I'm conscious that we are sort of running out of time. Um, one of the key things that we're also looking at here is how do we better advertise Australia as a destination of choice? How do we advertise Australia as a, a migration country that skilled migrants would like to, to relocate to, would like to live in, would like to contribute to more broadly? So we're doing a couple of things there. Um, I actually have, I work in the embassy in DC here. We have dedicated resources here, uh, Global Skills Attraction Officers, um, who actively engage. Uh, they actively in, engage with uh, you know, groups in the United States, groups in South America, and groups in uh, Canada. Um, we'll, we'll go to jobs fairs, we'll go to universities, uh, we will spruik, if you would like, what Australia has to offer. We will uh, talk about the opportunities that exist um, you know, for uh, folks in certain fields to relocate to Australia, to migrate to Australia. And it's a really important part of it. We've also invested recently in an advertising campaign. Uh, now, we've had a, a, a website um, in the first two months, which was, uh, again, it was plugging Australia as a great destination um, for skilled workers to move to. We had 7 million hits in the first two months at that website. Uh, so um, we're very happy with how that's gone. That was sort of launched in the first week of February uh, and sort of to the first week of 
April, we had over 7 million hits. Um, I think we've had, and sorry, I do have the figures before me, uh, but I think they're translated to some, some, somewhere like 54, 55,000 in subsequent uh, sort of engagements with our department to better understand what the migration pathways might be to Australia. Um, Andrew, I might leave it there if that's of use. That's great. That's great. Perfect, Patrick. And I think, by the way, you just did a very good job of advertising Australia right now, actually. So that was perfect and, and definitely on message. Um, wonderful. We have a few questions. I'm going to group it into four questions, and I'm going to go back in the order that we started, beginning with Director Jadu. And you can take any of these questions um, that you that you feel is appropriate. So and we're going to do sort of a round of two minutes each, if that's okay, to try and get through this. So let me group them into four. One one is about students. We had a number of questions about students and how we can make sure this was pretty directed at the US, but I think it's a question in every country and, and in, in Europe as well on how to make sure that the best and the brightest among students have an opportunity to stay and how do those pathways work. Um, secondly, there was a question around caregivers. This is an area that's often been left out in selection systems. It was directed at Canada, but but I think it's a, a really a question uh, in many contexts actually about, you know, there are not necessarily pathways and yet it's an area that is heavily dependent on, on immigrant workers, particularly immigrant women. Um, third, there's a question about spouses. It's something that Patrick just talked about, you know, the importance of spouses being able to work, but I, and I believe Director Jadu mentioned this as well. It is, it is something that is, you know, a, a question in many countries, how to make that possible. And then finally, there was a, a question about, uh, from a colleague of ours, I believe from IOM, asking about the, uh, the needs of sending countries and how to think of skills partnerships and, and also thinking of the circularity and the way that, that you build win-wins, not just for the countries that are that are getting immigrant talent, but also countries where they come from and where they may return in the future. So with that, choose whatever you want in two minutes. Let me go back to uh, Urjadun. Director Urjadun. Uh, th those are a lot of really good questions and I have a lot of good things to say about all of them, um, uh, but let me try to limit this. Uh, and and clearly we, we always think about how to ensure that our students um, whom have invested and we've invested in, our universities have invested in, communities have invested in, how do we uh, make sure they can stay? And certainly we have a lot of things that, that have been done over the years, including optional practical training extensions, um, uh, you know, OPT, as, as folks know, um, uh, ensuring that H-1Bs are processed and recognizing that there still aren't enough of those but also taking a look at our um, employment-based um, programs and ensuring that those are, are accessible. Um, that's one of the reasons. There's also another reason we, we, we created the international entrepreneur um, rule as well um, to try to find another pathway for people who might be funded. Um, so there, there are a multitude of things, but I think one of the issues uh, that is particularly pressing right now is as I think not as uh, sexy as I think Kate um, and 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 Julia were noting is processing times backlogs. There are just so many issues related to that to ensure that people still have their work authorization valid. That is a pressing issue at this moment. Um, but in terms of bigger picture, facing the longer term, um, uh, those are some of the questions we have. And and on caregivers, I couldn't agree more. It's not just caregivers. I think um, it's been noted. Uh, the focus sometimes can be on the higher skilled labor, but really it's it's all skills that we need, including caregivers and so many others. Um, so so that's it. I, I know some folks have mentioned um, uniting uh, the, the Ukraine and 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 what happened in Ukraine. And it was a sudden thing that we had to um, address. And so similarly, we did the same um, for Ukrainians. And one of the things that we focused heavily on is to ensure that when people arrive, they can quickly access work authorization. So connecting those skills and, and those come at all levels. Um, uh, so they're not very directly focused as our employment-based programs often are on a certain level of skill. This is everybody. And that model was used for uh, the other uh, process that we have broadened um, with Cuba um, Haiti, Venezuela, Nicaragua, um, and as you know, those are those are about thirty thousand a month. Um, and again, ensuring that the work authorization can be quickly obtained if the approval is there. 
So um, those are things that are innovative and have not necessarily been done before. It was usually a clunky process by which a person obtains their status. And then it takes this long period of time to process their work authorization. We're trying to close that gap. Great. Uh, thank you. Um, Deputy Mr. Fox, um, you choose any of those you want in two minutes. Chris, go ahead. Okay, I think I, I'll start with international students because that's a big uh, focus of our uh, our review, just in light of the fact that these pathways, this is a, a target clientele that we actually want to become permanent residents in this country as we sort of grow our immigration levels. But I think that there's a couple of things that we're reflecting on. The first is around the type of supports that are available uh, to international students, right? There tends to be um, in our system some changes between or differences between uh, Canadian students and their access to co-op terms or different types of program supports. And if we actually want to create more pathways to retain these students in Canada, then it would be in Canada's interest to think about those kind of supports in a different way um, to create those pathways. I think we also want to think about the integrity of our international student program. We do have some challenges around kind of the rise in private colleges here and private institutions, and that can lead to um, uh, challenges with the integrity of the, the, the permits themselves. And, and so that's another area of focus for us as we think about maybe trusted institutions where we could have an uncapped system versus maybe those that are new institutions and that haven't necessarily yet demonstrated an integrity framework within their um, organizations or institutions. Maybe they you kind of earn your way to an uncapped system because of the pressures. I mean, I think last year alone, we had over 500,000 applications for international students to come to this country and also extensions. So just the pressures on an uncapped system we're thinking about. And then I think I'll, I'll, um, I'll answer kind of the, the balance of it together in terms of caregivers, in terms of spousals, in terms of the needs that we have for um, PSWs, early childhood educators. Like I think we have to create um, uh, programs that are easier to navigate, that address some of the, the needs that we have in this country, uh, including early childhood educators, which are part of our uh, more uh, category-based express entry systems to try to target the uh, uh, that uh, that skills and talent we need. Um, but I think it's about not just looking at the programs, but also the pathways to permanent residency. If someone leaves their family for 10 years to come and become a caregiver here, I think we need to think about as a country, how do we have those pathways uh, to permanent residencies that are easy to navigate? And the final thing I would just say is, as we recruit talent, we have to think about the talent, not just as the individual, and that means their spouse, it means their family, and it means putting the individual at the front end of how we navigate our programs and our service offerings. And I think that's shifting from you go and navigate all these programs to we want you to come to Canada. Here's how we can be facilitative in our approach. So I will stop there, but thank you so much. That's great. And I saw Julia's eyes light up when you see it pathways from temporary to permanent because she has a paper that's coming out on that. And it's something we, we actually think about a lot is how do we begin to think about those those pathways between one and the other. Um, Michael Schotter. Yes, if I may, I will um, pick up on the very interesting comments so far, focusing on the on the caregivers and the uh, perhaps the needs of sending countries, because I think there's a kind of a connection between the two in a sense. Um, Last year, we came out with a, a policy document on the skills and talent uh, package, as we called it. And it did give quite a large focus to the needs that we saw and the op opportunities also uh, of developing um, legal pathways for, for caregivers and the needs because of the aging society, which we see only increasing and where the domestic population uh, workforce is not really able to to meet those those needs. I, I think uh, one of your speakers uh, already mentioned about the the ratio uh, and the changes over the last year. So this is a, a real um, strategic sector of our strategic need that we have. I think uh, where I think there will be a good understanding also amongst the general public of of, of, of the interest here. It's also overlapping with our engagement uh, and our discussions on the talent partnerships which we have with these uh, particular countries. Um, and that, that's uh, an interesting uh, channel of discussion. One thing that does come out in the European context, of course, is the, is the language uh, element, because, of course, we're a, a union with many different languages. Um, and if you're talking about care, 
it's really fundamental that you, you're able to communicate. Uh, so this is something that I, I think we have to, to dig down into, but it's all part of um, the, the ease and the success which we'll have in making the talent partnerships work at European level would depend on the, the recognition or the accreditation that we can give to various skills. I'm not talking about qualifications, that's a much higher hurdle. Um, but when it comes to caregivers, maybe we're not talking about sort of nursing skills at, at, at that level, but general sort of human skills, care skills, which, uh, you know, are very, very important. But somehow we have for the trust in the system to think very carefully about how we validate certain skills so that the trust is there on all sides. And of course, this can also be an investment, uh, a, a serious investment on the part of those who are, who want, who are interested in coming to the European Union. Uh, so we also have to think about it from their perspective as well, so that we don't waste their 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 time and efforts, uh, and we don't lead to uh, misconceptions or misunderstandings. So that's very important. And in terms of circular migration, that's a that's a delicate balance we have to think about there, because um, especially when we have discussions with some of our partner countries, some of them are very sensitive on this, uh, uh, especially on the sort of higher end uh, skills that we might be looking for. So. It's all part of the tailoring up of, of the partnership, I would say, but it's an important element because others obviously are looking for more integrated approach. Thank you. Um, and then finally over to you, Patrick Hallinan. And I'm afraid you're, you're, you're going to have the last word. Patrick, you'll be the last word. You'll be the last word here. All right, thanks, Andrew. Well, um, I was going to keep my comments fairly, fairly short and fairly targeted just to two, two topics. Uh, international students, um, fundamentally important to us. I think we've recognised for some time uh, that the benefits of, uh, you know, highly trained, highly qualified um, individuals and the difference they can make, particularly in critical areas of industry for us. Um, so I think that uh, we very much recognise that. It's both a really important uh, export industry, funnily enough, for us, sort of in international education, uh, but um, we really want to offer uh, to uh, highly skilled, highly qualified um, you know, temporary international students and opportunity of a permanent permanent uh, outcome. The second point I was just going to make um, is is very much uh, about that transition from temporary to permanent. Um, it depends on the nature of the of the visa class that you may have uh, that brought you to Australia in the first instance. Um, but when I talked before about the school migration program or the migration program more broadly for this uh, this uh, program year. Um, aiming for 195,000, a sizable chunk of those individuals are currently onshore in Australia uh, and will become, uh, you know, sort of, oh, excuse me, they're already permanent. We, we have um, a sizable chunk of the permanent, excuse me, are already on, uh, they are already on shore, but they're on shore in, in temporary. Sorry, I think I accidentally muted myself. Just saying uh, a sizable chunk of our permanent migrants are indeed in Australia, they're on shore uh, on temporary visas uh, in the first instance. This is an important part of how our system works uh, and um, I'd be surprised if that changes. Thank you to all of our panelists. Let's do a round of applause actually. I know everyone else just signed, but I mean really a fabulous panel. Thank you for spending some time with us, everyone from, from the governments of, of the United States, Canada, Australia, and the European Commission. Um, great to have you with us. Thank you to Kate and Julia for their insights. And we look forward to continuing the conversation as we move forward working on global skills and talent and something I know that, that each of you is, is particularly committed to as we go forward. Thank you.